All right, well, obviously it's uh, Welsh miners on the Western Front. And now, I'd just like to make a couple of things clear for the start. Um, such was the pace of recruitment into the, rec into the tunnelling companies that miners from all over, the, all over the British Isles were just drawn away and just put into tunnelling companies as and when they were needed. So uh, there's no actually all Welsh uh, tunnelling companies, so to speak, although I did find Welsh miners in each and every, um, each and every tunnelling company. And I would like to say absolutely clearly, there's no suggestion from me that the Welsh miners are any way sort of superior or better or whatever than the, the miners from the British coal fields. But what I'd like to think is, by me now discussing their actual experiences, then maybe you can reflect that into the, uh, the miners from all over the British uh, coal fields, um, and their experiences. And I think they're a very, very select and very, very uh, courageous band of men. Now, uh, uh, South Wales was actually the, the major uh, in Wales here, but you'll see there's actually, these are the major regions there, South Wales is about 20%. And in, in uh, 1913 was yet again another uh, record output by the, by the British coal fields, something like 287 million tonnes of coal, uh, 1 million people, 3,000 mines. It was a huge industry uh, going on there. But it was marred in Wynne, Wales in October 1913 when, of course, the Universal Colliery in St. Genneth, uh, 439 people were killed. Right. Okay, uh, so who are these Welsh miners I'm going to talk about? Well, this one here, it's a, it's a Godre Grey uh, Colliery. This is in 1910, and what immediately impresses me is the actual age span of these people. Um, you may see, um, I think this is, this is the gaffer on the surface, I think, but they've all got the snap boxes here. So this chap, he certainly looks well into his 50s, if not 60s. You've got the rather younger chaps here coming along here. But what is very noticeable, you've got all these youngsters here. You've got the young lads there coming there. Now, People always say to me in Wales, they're all five foot four little boys, you know. <laughs> uh, Welshmen are all little chaps. Just imagine this chappy here. Just imagine him going into one of these tunnels, you know. So I didn't find many men five foot four, I must say. Uh, so, right, so if I just have a look at these men. Uh, this is uh, John Davis, just 12 years old, uh, in 1897. Just, uh, and this is the sort of age. That's his first day at work there. I've got... Um, some youngsters there, the tools look as big as them, actually. And I, I, this chap here, I don't know what age he would be, but I, what I'm saying is they would start work um, v very young indeed. Um, and unfortunately, uh, although young lads were, young, young boys under 10, were not allowed to go into the coal mines after the 1890s, uh, in fact, in the small mines, I've certainly found evidence of this sort of thing, just a little nipper there. And what he's doing, he's actually harnessed He's got a harness around him, and he's actually pulling a tram of coal up a slope. The, the, a spout hole is where they create a narrow hole, just small hole, from one road to another for ventilation purposes. And you've got, this is the sort of thing that these youngsters would be doing. On the small mines, I agree. Um, if he was lucky, if he was lucky, he would be in the main haulage there with, with a horse-drawn uh, thing there. But what impresses me with lots of photographs is that the youngsters, if a camera is around, you'd expect the youngsters to be sort of looking at the camera, but I find, I never found one single youngster actually smiling underground. You see him there. Uh, this may be, maybe that's his father, I don't know, but again, he's looking uh, quite dejected and looking away. But I think the point to make is, on this, when you start work at 14, okay, you could be the butt of jokes, but when you get to 15, maybe now you are pushing it down that way. You get to 16 and 17, you're growing, you're a big lad coming on now. And I think it's of absolutely no surprise to me at all that these young boys should actually go into the army, say they were 19, and this line about the age. Because you can imagine the jingoism of the war and the military, and goodness knows what, their friends going off to war, they would want to go. So I don't worry about that. Uh, you can see the sort of, uh, uh, this chap, I reckon he, David Beatty might have seen his hat there. I think if you look at the angle there, that's, that's, uh, that, that's the, the young lad there. Now, the, the work itself, South Wales didn't lend itself to military mining. The, the coal was very friable and the seams were not very even running. And the sort of thing that they would do, this chap here, he'd put up his sprags. This is a big seam. He would actually 
cut a taper down there. He'd cut a taper lying there, lying there in the water and the mud, and he'd be listening to it, talking to him, literally talking to him. And when he decided he'd, he'd actually cut enough away, he'd come out, pull the sprags away, and this would come down in one great pile come down. If it didn't come down, he'd have to drill it, drill and it exposes. Now, they were paid by piecework, not on an hourly rate, so they wanted to get it down. And it's a question of listening to it. And um, something I've done. Right. Some of the seams are quite narrow. When we start thinking about them working on the Western Front, you'll see there's quite narrow seams of work as well. And uh, here, I like this one because he seems to have melded into the core, doesn't he? But I'm not very happy about the sprags there. I don't think I was very clever with him there. But this is the sort of work that they were doing. If there was no horse around, picking a drift mine. This would be a drift mine. Um, you've just got to push the stuff out. And I think this chap looks fairly relaxed, but you can see he's putting everything. So it's hard, difficult work. This is what they were doing. Uh, this is minor stuff. Um, dare I say, they're probably talking about how Wales are going to maybe beat England in rugby, but uh, that's by the way. Um, but this would be the minor snap. And then, of course, when they finish work, if you see our Green Rye Valley, it's all nice, isn't it? They, they sort of just walked across the bridge and they were in work. But many of them had to walk literally from one valley to the next in all weathers, go in there, no pet head baths, no, no changing facilities. They would have to do that. And uh, this is actually taken in the 1930s. I got this because simply pit head baths came very, very uh, late in, into Wales. And this is 1930, and I said, well, this the tower there for the children. But he's having to wash in, the, in a bath in front of the, in front of the fire. Uh, the wife is darning, but of course her job was pretty horrible because if she had a husband and, and sons who could be working different shifts, her job was to get it all washed and cleaned and ironed and get it all ready in fairly primitive circumstances, I think, there. And this chap, you know, this is an older man who's actually... Uh, I'm dying on there. Now, I have a photograph here of this, a Pentamount Colliery, Pont de Berry, Gwendryth Valley. These are actually the officials. And you can just see that while some of them are nicely dressed, you still see the chaps. Obviously, uh, the officials are not there down in the pit working. And uh, the, these men would tend to be the NCOs brought, brought into, the, into the thing. Now, the majority of the, uh, of, the, of the miners were actually belonging to the non-conformist church and the South Wales Fed were very, very anti-war stance. And a very few Welsh were actually in the army before the war. But once the war was declared, there was this amazing turnaround where the church leaders and the miners' agents, all suddenly it all became about uh, patriotism and king and country and you must go into the war. I accept that that's a, you know, that's a possible reason, but I would suggest that a lot of the people actually, they just wanted to get out of the pit because what, to them they thought open air and exercise, regular meals, chance for adventure, let's go. And I've got a couple of quotes uh, on this. Uh, Irving Jones, when he was asked, did you volunteer? He said, I was working in the colliery and there were people joining up, you know, and I thought, oh, well, my brother-in-law, we discussed it and we decided to join up. We thought, well, a holiday maybe, you know, that's what we thought. We'd beat the Germans in about six months. That's what we thought. And the second one, Oliver Powell, when he was asked the same question, he said, oh, yes, a great patriot I was, bloody glad to get out of the pit. I thought it'd be over by Christmas, 1914, what a joke. So I would suggest that, yes, they went for, while for the patriots, I'm sure. It, I think you could possibly say the older guys might, might, have, might have done this, but certainly amongst the youngsters, I got lots of answers of this. Now, when the war was declared, about 150,000 Welsh mi uh, British miners were actually uh, went into the war in that short period from August to December, when recruitment was at its peak, and uh, about 30,000 uh, Welshmen. But what's important, I think, is that when they went into the war, when they went in, there was no mining unit. There's no mining unit in the, in the army when it started then, and it was when, when the mining started. John French was to say, well, get the Royal Engineers to do it. Get the Royal Engineers. Now, if you look at this, you know, the bridge building, they're doing roads, they're doing transport, they're doing rail, they're doing all sorts of work. They didn't have any miners anyway. So there was no way could the Royal Engineers, they were hopelessly out, out uh, to far too much work anyway, so they certainly um, uh, couldn't do that. So they went in as soldiers, as, as soldiers, I think it's, it's quite uh, realistic to say that. And uh, I've got a photograph here of 185 Company, and uh, I think we've talked about secrecy and silence. It would be somewhere in France. This is where one of the tunnels there. Now, speaking as a, uh, personally on this, I think mining conditions couldn't have been different from the miner. You know, when I was going to work, if I saw headgear, a winder house and change, that's when I started to get to work, when I saw these obvious signs. But for the miners, 
the, particularly the volunteers, you know, they come out in the matter of days, for them to actually go to the so-called going to work in the mines, Flanders, relatively flat, no sign of mining whatsoever. There would be no familiar headgear. The whole idea was secrecy. And for them to get to there, they would have to find themselves down in support trenches and trying to get to the, to the place of work with artillery fire, sniper fire, certainly the, the Germans were very much aware that if there was mining going on, there would be men coming in. So it was absolutely, for me, a complete uh, different uh, thing altogether. Of course, they'd come from relatively sophisticated mining, if you want, but when the, when the mining units were put together, there was no, uh, you know, as we've talked about the geology, there were no geologists and surveyors and uh, all this fancy equipment and so on. They had to make do with whatever was going, and that was quite a, quite a thing for them. Now, the miners were recruited, they were recruited from the field, in the field, men who were actually in regiments already, and then volunteers from home. And the, if you read the history books, they, they perhaps they don't, they, plan, they tend to say, oh, well, they, all, they were really civilian miners, you know, they all, they, they didn't know how to salute and so on. Well, I would suggest the miners who had been in there for, for a good while in the regiments, they certainly knew what military discipline was all about. So I'm not quite happy ab about that. So. What about the experiences of all this? I think uh, Peter Barton mentioned something about, about the, the weather conditions and so on. Now, I'm uh, pretty doom and gloom to start, but um, certainly the conditions were extremely bad. And I've got lots and lots of exercises of, of, of um, Welsh miners who actually didn't last more than a month, some only weeks, uh, with all sorts of illnesses. And I'm just going to have a look at that. Should be mentioned, you had to be 19 to go abroad. 19. If you were 45 or over, you had to have a special medical. Now, I've got so many, quite frankly, so many, it must have been a huge birth control or birth, whatever it was. I got so many boys, 19, not 18, not 20. I got 19. I've also got so many uh, minors, 44. 45, we did a special. And they're 44. Not 43, 44. So it's obviously, it comes into this. Now, I don't actually have a photograph of the chap I'm going to talk about, but I just want to put the image of a young soldier uh, up on there, uh, George Watts. George Watts was from Cardiff. Now, he had, um, he had, uh, he had uh, three brothers and five sisters. And George, in, 19, in 1916, he went in the army. He declared his age to be 19 years and six months. In he went, underground laborer. He lasted about three weeks. He was then, uh, he, went, he fell ill. Doctor took one look at him and said, look, lad, you know, you're just not 19. You, you, you're home. And off he went home. I looked at the 19, uh, I looked at the 1911 census, and in fact, he was in 1911. He was 11 years old. He'd actually been born in 1900. So when he this 19 years and eight months, he was actually 16. He was actually 16. Now, uh, it's a, it, you've got to be careful if I say this. Anyone who's read uh, Richard Van Emden's book on boy soldiers will realise the agony that the, uh, the anguish that the parents went through trying to get these young boys to come back. They'd put, they'd give them the wrong names, they'd give them wrong addresses, they'd skedaddle whatever, and when, even when they sent somebody to bring them back, they would go missing and hiding. And you had boys of 18 who would say, um, no, I've been here two years. If you take me out now, I'll be shamed for the rest of my life. I want to stay here. You know, I'm a man now. And so, so it's a very complex problem. But George was actually... Now, so a simplistic way would say he had 15 days training. Now, obviously, he didn't come home for 15 days, so the parents must have been some form of collusion, isn't there? You know, it must have been... They could easily have brought him back if they wanted to. So George went off, and what I, what I can read between the lines, it obviously would be the father, quite frankly, was very proud, and the mother was rather nervous about it all. So George actually came home. No doubt he came home, and uh, he was a hero, I would have thought, to his, you know, with his uniform, and he'd been to France, and, you know, when you think of the Welsh valleys, they certainly don't... They hardly get out of the valley themselves. So that's the young lad there. Now, again, I'm a bit short on photographs, but this is a, a chappie called Walter Williams. For the observant, I think you'd see that he's in the Northumberland Regiment. This is, uh, you see, this is the sort of anguish that they went through in the trouble. This is him. This is him two years later. Now, it's, it's estimated about 28,000... Uh, young boys, underage boys, were actually killed, about 100, 110,000 casualties. Uh, of course, uh, you, you the a gravestone here, Albert French, just 16 years of age. And I think if you go around the, if, if you go around the battlefields, you'll certainly see these. There is, of course, the celebrated one of the lad 14, just 14. So, all right. So that's the, that's the youngsters. 
Now, if I go now to the other side of the fence, to the chappies who are 44, um, lots of photographs like this. I tried to compress it a bit to give him a sort of, give him a bit, a bit of body there, but that's the sort of chappy there. And the story that I have of these, there were two men, they were actually in the same street, George Purnell and George Nichols. And these two chaps enlisted together, they embarked together, they went in the, into the army, and just three weeks later, out they went. They were no longer considered to be uh, physically fit. And uh, George, who had given his age at 44, but George Nichols made a bit of a mistake because he gave his age at 49. That's the only one I ever found was George. So as he was 49, he had to have a special medical, which he did, and it's in his service record stamped. But within, within these matter of weeks, they were suddenly found to be out. Out they went. Uh, George was suffering from uh, senility and bronchitis. Uh, George Nichols was suffering from senility and debility. Now, in a recurring story there, the medical report seemed to be okay, but once they find out that they lied about their ages, things take a dramatic twist then. George was actually, George, George Purnell, the 44-year-old, was 55, and George Nichols at 49, he was found to be 59. So, uh, the, but, it, but they both received a gratuity payment of £12.10. Now, they were both married with children, and I'm just a little bit amused. When they got home, I wonder what their wife said. <laughs> could you imagine them getting home? You know, you know, you know I, I just imagine that. He could possibly say he got £12.10s out of it, so, so that's not too bad. Um, now, although the conditions were pretty bad in, 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 in um, South Wales, in the underground, the slate mines, the story is absolutely dreadful. The conditions that they worked under are far worse than anything in the in slate mines. And I have a story here which I find quite amusing. Uh, we have uh, six miners turned up from Blaina Festiniog, which is a slate mine. And uh, they came there, the, 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 uh, do the doctor took one look at them and said, I cannot pass these guys. No, I mean, some of them got malnutrition, I'm, I can't. So there was a chap, Frederick Highland, who was a, was a quite a well-known tunnel to come. He was desperate for money. He said, look, I'll, I'll take them short term if I have to. As long as I got somebody now, I need... He said, well, you'll have to sign for them. So he signed for them. So he went in to see them, six lads, and he said, boys, don't have to worry. You've all passed your medical. Wonderful smile from everybody, not a tooth in sight. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's it there. So, and it was quite interesting, you know. They got a £20 gratuity. Uh, £20 gratuity... And I got another team of six that came out within three weeks and went back. And I just wonder whether 20 pounds came into it. <laughs> That's a bit cynical, but, uh, uh, well, the doctor was obviously saying they were fit. So that's it. Um, it unfortunately, it, it wasn't confined just to, uh, just to the older people. I'm afraid I found people there. Um, but tuberculosis was, was quite rife amongst these, uh, particularly the young men. And, and, and John Daniel Thomas, just 21, uh, he lasted for two and a half months and being, for being considered no longer physically fit. His medical report said, taken ill with cough and pain inside and after coming out of the trenches, he had lost two stone in weight. And uh, he was found, the cause of discharge was given as tuberculosis, disease of lungs. He was awarded a pension of 25 shillings, but as of uh, this thing carries on, uh, rather on the to be reviewed. If it was over 20%, you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to buy a pension. Under 20%, no. And I've got lots of cases where it says not 20% or 19%. And, and, uh, and so when it says to be reviewed, I, I'm not quite sure what happened there. But um, the one that I'm not happy about, because um, I, I followed this up with the family, uh, so it's a pretty well-known uh, thing of, of, of somebody being gassed. Now, uh, Edward Thomas... Uh, he, well, he, he enlisted, and he gave his age as 44. Uh, I kid you not, he's 44. But um, he was actually gassed on two separate occasions. The second, sufficiently serious, he was repatriated, and he came home. At the age of 44, when it came to his medical report, it's a nice even report. This man is now 50%, 50% disability. Uh, but then he was found out that his age was actually 49. And the whole report's changed, it said, and it's actually got written on his medical report, date of origin of disability indeterminable. So now they swung it over that it was actually his mining experience rather than the gas. And then it dropped very quickly from 50%. It dropped in every six months. And then I had a, a senior surgeon, he signed himself, he says, next board, please report whether aggravation due to active service has completely moved away. Perhaps I'm a bit cynical, but six months later, there's the report, no grounds for further pension or gratuity, no disability. And Edward died six months later. So these things about pensions are rather difficult. It's, a, it, it's something that uh, I've had people 
modern soldiers today telling me it, it doesn't change much, but I'll probably pass on that. Right, anybody who's been at the battlefields will know that the shell holes, you know, is prevalent there. And I have a story of Walter Jones. He was, uh, he wasn't 44, he was <laughs> Jones. And his medical report says, this man fell into a shell hole full of water and was unable to get out for several hours. His illness dates from this and he was sent home in December 1915, suffering from rheumatism. But he went back to France in February 1916. Just two months later, after rheumatism, he's gone back. Again went sick and had rheumatism in feet, knees and spine, uh, result of active service. Active service. Disability for 50% for six months, then likely, to then likely to improve. Within 12 months, he was judged to be quite fit and he didn't get any more pension. So they obviously had a cure for, dis cure for rheumatism, presumably. All right, that's enough uh, doom and gloom, I think, from me. Um, uh, medal ceremonies. Um, Obviously, they, when I talk about the Welsh miners, I'm talking of the miners at large. But there were three cases I'd, I'd like to mention here. Uh, James William Hall, it says here he had a DCM for con conspicuous coolness and resource under fire on the 9th of August 1915. His section officer was severely wounded and buried in the ruins of dugout. But Sapper Hall rescued him under heavy shell fire and conveyed him to safety. He then rallied and took command of his section, posting them in a mine gallery. And I think that reflects the, 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 the self-discipline that every miner had, didn't he? He was underground, he had to look after himself and the men around him. So that doesn't surprise me. Uh, David Edward Lewis from uh, Sinclair's in Carmarthenshire, uh, he went on a, tri a, a trench raid. Now, anyone followed up these trench raids, you can imagine at night, these chaps crawling over these shell holes and the mud and trying to get to the other side. Germans obviously alert, and they get over the other side, and they say they're going to take a prisoner or assess what was there. But David John Lewis, with explosives on his back, he crawled over. He, he, he had some idea they were mining over that side. He get down into the German trench, and he actually found uh, entrance. He took the explosives, threw it down, and actually exploded down there. So it was quite a, a brave act, I think. He got that. But the story I do like to tell is a man called William Morgan. Now, William Morgan was with two others. He's working at the face. He's working at the face. Now, don't forget, this is this four-foot face down there somewhere. It's not sort of birdsong type thing. He's down there. And he's doing this, and the, the sidewall come away. The, the, that's good, right? And there was timbers there. So they realized, this is, a German, this is a German gallery here. They listened carefully, and they couldn't hear anything. So they prized one of the timbers away, down in this thing, I, I try to imagine, they prized it away and they looked inside and there was 1,350 pounds of explosive complete with fuses, detonators, ready to go. What steps would I have taken? The big ones that way. <laughs> These guys, they prized the wood away, they went in and literally stole the, 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 the explosives. What they'd done, they took the detonator out, reconnected the wires such that there was a complete circuit if the officers were checking for a circuit, and they actually removed the 1,350 pounds, took it out, and the war diary does record, we used it later on, rather. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, you know, you must realize this was all in this little four-foot thing. You lay down in there, and to do that, I think that was tremendous courage, and, and they got a DCM for that. Right, now, on a, on a rather different note again, I'm trying to pick sort of different ones. This is the um, Her Majesty's um, hospital ship. I did call it a holiday ship. Hospital ship, the Anglia. It was used between Anglesey and the mainland, uh, just a small passenger carrier. It was taken over by the government and turned into a hospital ship. And what, what it actually does, they would, they would paint the hull white, there would be a large green strand down here, and there would be red crosses on it, so it's, you cannot f fault that. It was carrying, fi figures seem to doubt on this, the king had actually used this, in, had come back from France in early November. So I'm talking late November. And uh, what happened was, it was said there was about 500 on board. They had casualties, amputees, and um, what have you, doctors and whatever else. It was coming into Falmouth Harbour, and the description says that the relatives were there on the quayside waiting for the ship to come in. Uh, Ellis Jones, I've got a Welshman who was amongst this. I don't know what... Uh, uh, what his illness was, but disaster struck, absolute disaster. It hit a, a mine right at the uh, face in heavy swell. 
It hit on a heavy swell, um, and it sunk within about 15 minutes. Uh, there, was a, there was a destroyer, the Ewer it's called, up there. It's only got a 12-foot draft there. So they were trying to get that in there, but you can imagine the, the, the confusion of, of, the, of the cot cases and the amputees and so on. And it was, it was something like 400 actually drowned on that day there. And uh, actually, uh, they are commemorated at the Hollybrook Memorial in Southampton Cemetery. So that must have been, the, I'm not sure if Ellis Jones's uh, family were there, but it must have been a tremendous shock to the, to the relatives to see that, uh, to see that going down. Uh, prisoners of war, uh, we, we do tend to get these photographs, don't we, of the, the, the officers all nicely dressed with an officer there, football team, it's all pretty jolly hockey sticks, and you get this sort of thing uh, coming on, but I would suggest I would suggest that this is a far more realistic uh, thing. This is it. It's drab. You know, you, you don't even want to think about their life in there. And we have talked about sanitation and, and uh, nutrition values and so on. And of course, this is a very famous photograph uh, of, of a detective. But I think he captures it uh, rather well. I've got an Aubrey, uh, Herbert Aubrey Clifford. What happened to him was quite, well, quite in, in, incredible, actually. Uh, he was underground, and the Germans blew a camouflage, an underground bomb. And it all collapsed, and there were seven, seven men were reported as being missing, presumed dead. But he was actually blown into the German gallery, into the German gallery. He ran as fast as he could, but he was taken uh, prisoner. He was taken prisoner. He was then shipped very slowly and quietly over to po Poland, into the forest there to work. And it was only six weeks later that the family were informed he was a prisoner of war. And he was actually reported dead at the time. So that, that would have been quite a thing. Um, it was quite interesting that when he got there, um, he found he was from Monmouthshire, and the first Monmouth, there was 120 men from the first Monmouth as prisoners of war, and they were being sent all sorts of goodies from, the, from uh, Monmouthshire. Uh, so he, was, he found himself in good company. He did complain of lung and chest trouble. He'd been, he was there for three and a half years. He did complain of uh, a thing, but his condition was described as normal, and he was transferred to class Z. So that was his experience. Although I got a William John Gardner, um, he was only there four months, but when he came out, he had such a nervous disability, he, um, it was actually 50% he was rated at, and it doesn't say anything about reviewing, he was simply given, um, giving a, a pension for him and his wife. So that's the story of them. Um, on the question of desertion, um, you may not be aware, um, if you're on leave, from the time you leave your house and start to go to that, you're then considered to be on active service. If you're, on, if you're in France, obviously you're on active service. But if you're on leave, then you, you're, um, you, you, you'll then be, you, you will not be liable for execution. It's a jail sentence. And I have a story of uh, Morgan Morgan. Uh, he was actually went on leave. Uh, he went on leave, and he actually deserted whilst he was on leave. And they got all sorts of things coming here from the police station in Rumney saying all possible inquiries to find him, etc., etc. It goes on. But then the chief constable of, of uh, Glamorganshire, not just the era, he says, please look in his mother's courthouse. So he was apprehended the next day. Now, I don't know if they found him in the courthouse, but I thought it, it's quite a, uh, whether Morgan had done Morgan, well, perhaps he'd done this before. Um, but anyway, he was apprehended, he was, uh, he was uh, J, uh, well, sent to the but as would be normal, it was quashed and he was sent back out again. Why should he be languishing in jail when he should be getting back out there? That was the sort of attitude they needed, the people there. But the tragic story I have, and I've been involved in this um, there with the family, uh, there was a David John Lewis, he was 21 years old, he'd been on leave, he'd gone back, he'd been on leave, he'd been back, and now it's the 7th of November 19, 1918, four days before the armistice. He said goodbye to his family, he walked out, and he was never heard of again. And uh, he's never been heard of again, uh, I can say that now. And uh, it caused great, uh, great anguish to his family. Even today, they feel the same way, because although they tried to find him, they just, they just simply disappeared. And a court of inquiry findings said, DJ Lewis illegally absented himself without leave on the 7th of November 1918, and he is still so absent, that on 7th of November 1918, he had a full kit, that on 8th of November 1918, he was deficient of this kit to the value of 16 pounds, six shillings, and seven and three fathers, but he was classed as a deserter on active service. Now, towards the end of 1918, people did tend to catch a few days, you know, off they leave. You know, they, they weren't exactly from the ticket and said, get that ship. They just turned up at the key and got. So they were catching a few. Now, I, if something, 
oh, if something could happen, he, all he could have done was just simply turn up and say, look, sorry, lads, are late. Because it's the armistice, the excitement. He could possibly have got away with it, but we didn't. Uh, we've certainly heard nothing. I've tried, well, I've tried hard on this. Okay, so that's the rather dismal side of it. Uh, one family, I think we just mentioned, families ask me to find out about their, uh, their loved ones. And I think if they ask a question, I'm afraid, you've got to take what's coming. It's not all, you know, that they might have this romantic idea, but then you can come up with some fairly disastrous. But I was asked this to have Thomas Rogers, he was told, in, in, in the, well, the, of the grants, and he said, I understand he was a bit of a cad. So I had to look at his, his record. Now, this chap, this chap, uh, his service record, he was missing on three separate occasions. He was late for roll call on four occasions. He was drunk on active service. He was found in an SMA during prohibited hours. He was placed under cross arrest for striking an officer being in the execution of his duties, and he was sentenced to six months. It was suspended. Six days later, he was again sentenced to six months for striking an officer being in the execution of his duties. I don't have the same officer, but uh, there, that's him. Then he comes out after five months. He was then gassed on two occasions. He was gunshot wound. This chap did it on. His finest, uh, finest misdemeanor was overstaying his leave, and yet he was honorably discharged as a minor in November 1918. Uh, I must say, the family are thrilled to bits. They were thrilled to bits. They were thrilled to bits on that. And uh, the other one then is John uh, Christopher Chilcott. With this lad, it says here, uh, he was guilt, uh, conduct of the previous side of good order and military discipline in that he, in the field at 10.30 p.m., was found near a house of a civilian in possession of obvious plunder, namely 10 bottles of wine. <laughs> good man. <laughs> What he was doing with 10 bottles of wine, what was he going to do with the 10 bottles of wine? What happened to the 10 bottles of wine? Perhaps it was interesting. But that's the, that's the sort of thing I have there. Um, on the other side of things, uh, on a post armistice, this chubby, he was actually on leave when armistice was called, but he was told to go back. So he said farewell to his family, he'd come through the war, he went back, and uh, you know that the, the, the miners after the armistice did an awful lot of uh, defusing bombs, booby traps and delay action and landmines. And he actually was injured whilst on duty, accidentally wounded in left buttock by explosion of bomb in a tunnel mine. So obviously, and, and uh, I, don't, I haven't got records of people actually being killed after the armistice, but I've certainly got uh, reports of these men actually being injured whilst doing this was doing this job. What is interesting, although he was uh, he said there was no obvious damage, uh, it permanently unfit, it's interesting, he was actually given a, a gratuity of £52.10, which is an awful lot of money compared to what other men were getting, £12.10, £20. So 50, perhaps, perhaps it was after the war, I'm not quite sure. Okay, I'm pushing on now, coming near the end. Uh, this is a remembrance, I'll come back to this gentleman later, but just, I'd like to just sort of uh, remembrance to these people who died. What, what about the men who actually died out there? And I've got three men, actually, uh, again, I got involved with the families, I, I've learned a lesson on this. I've got, I learned that the first one, John Williams, he's from Slant Romney in, uh, in, in uh, Monmouth. The war diary says, two sappers asphyxiated in mines, having descended in disobedience of orders. Now, I can't explain why this would be so. Why would these two men, uh, he's, he was, um, sorry, Robert Clifford from Yorkshire, why would these two men go underground? They'd been an underground camouflage, explosives, carbon monoxide, you need them. A trace of carbon monoxide has been deadly dangerous, yet they went underground. And uh, it's, it's April 1915. They didn't actually introduce gas procedures till May, and the proto-operators never came out till then. So I'm not sure why would these men go underground. Um, hmm, I'd rather not come here. But anyway, he's, he's at the Manning Gate, uh, uh, John Williams. So it, it is a matter of conjecture on there, but certainly the family were, uh, were upset. And that I can say, they were upset. Another man, uh, I'd rather be nameless on this, um, he, uh, my chest is up, he actually, um, somehow or other, he got hold of two jars of rum. He took it back there, and he was drinking a lot there with one of his mates, Isloin Thomas. Isloin decided it was too heavy for him, and Isloin went. But this man continued drinking, and he actually died of alcoholic poisoning. And in his service record, it says, died of alcoholic poisoning. Now, I just handed it to the family, quite frankly, and disappeared, you know. It's first for them to do that. Um, but, you know, because I've been to his gravestone, killed in action. 
He was killed in action. There it is. And the family are quite happy with that. But then th th this came up here. He was actually found, and it, unfortunately, it does actually say died of alcoholic poisoning on that. Um, now then, we've got William Hackett. Um, this is the, the only man to get a VC um, uh, in, in um, of all the tunnels, he was the only man there. What had happened, there was an underground explosion, German explosion, five men were trapped. Three men were cleared out, but when it came to, the, the, to Hackett, there was a, still a man inside the face. When it came to him, he, he, he's quoted some different quotes on this. I think Simon backed this up. Um, I am a tunneler, I must look after the others first. So he refused to be rescued. He wanted to stay with the fifth man. Well, uh, there was a lot of enemy action around. They disappeared. It collapsed, and they both died. And, and what interested me, apart from him, of course, is this chap is Thomas Collins. Now, what's interesting about him is he was not a tunneler. He was actually an attached, uh, attached soldier, but he was a miner. Now, don't forget, he's getting one shilling and a penny a day. William Hackett's getting six shillings a day, six, six months a day. There's a huge difference here, but presumably because he was a miner, he didn't want to just be humping this stuff out and, you know, doing all that. He wanted to get in the face, so he was actually in the face. And I know for a fact that the family are very proud of this. They all, the idea was that he had died, killed in action. They never knew. They thought it was.